Thank you for that introduction. I am Rebecca Perks, and as Sue said, I'm a nurse practitioner, uh, Bay State OBGYN group. My office is in South Hadley. I've been there for 15 years working as a GYN and women's health nurse practitioner, and I am certified by the North American Menopause Society. The North American Menopause Society, it's a great organization, and if you're looking for information about menopause, um, that's a good site to Google and, and get good, accurate information there. So I'm really excited about the talk today. Uh, menopause and hormone therapy are one of the my favorite things to talk about with my patients. So I'm excited to share some information with everybody. It's kind of a funny format for me because I can't see everybody. I'm used to having a face-to-face -face, um, you know, discussions with patients, and, and this is a little different, but um, hopefully it'll work out well and you'll get some good information and I'm excited to get some questions at the end. So with that, I'll go right ahead. I think I will. There we go. So I don't have any com conflicts of interest to disclose. And the, what we're going to do today in, in my talk is I'm going to start out by just going over the definition of menopause and what menopause means. And then I'm going to talk about some of the symptoms of menopause and some things that women experience um, in the menopausal transition. And then finally, I'm going to hit on some management options for menopausal symptoms. I'm mainly going to focus on hormone therapy, but I'm also going to touch on uh, non-hormonal medications and complementary therapies as well. I just wanted to make a quick note about language uh, as I go ahead. Um, I, when I'm talking about this subject, I'm definitely talking about women's experience in menopause, but I just wanted to acknowledge that not everybody who experiences menopause is a woman. They're also transgender or non-binary and other folks who experience menopause too. And I definitely want to include those people um, in this information in this talk. So before I talk about menopause, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about the menstrual cycle and before menopause and what's going on. Because in order to stand, understand what happens when someone becomes menopausal, you kind of have to back up and understand a little bit about the menstrual cycle. You don't have to have a PhD in it, but just some basics. So I just want to go over that just really briefly. So in this picture here, I think you can see my cursor. On the top, um, that's the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is in your brain, it's this little gland. And then on the bottom here, we have the uterus and the ovaries, and here's some tubes leading into there. Those are the fallopian tubes. So in when um, people have menstrual cycle, like a normal monthly period, there's communication between the pituitary gland and the ovaries. The ovaries are the part of the anatomy that produce the hormones. So the uterus actually is just like a little muscular sac. It doesn't produce any hormones. The ovaries are what produce hormones and also where the eggs come from. So there's this what we call a feedback loop. There's this communication between the pituitary and the ovaries back and forth. The pituitary sends uh, hormonal signals to the ovaries, and the ovaries respond by producing hormones. And for our purposes, the most important that we're going to talk about is estrogen or estradiol is another name for that, and then progesterone. So they send those signals back to the pituitary, and there's a communication between the two. An interesting fact is that all of the eggs that you're ever going to have are in your ovaries when you're born. You don't make any new eggs along the way. So um, when you, if you're not on birth control, when you have a period every month, you release an egg, it goes down the fallopian tubes into the uterus. The uterus um, is thickened, the lining is thickened with blood. If there's no pregnancy and the egg doesn't get fertilized, the uterine lining sheds and the egg gets um, discarded with the blood and that's what a period is. So when you go through menopause, that cycle stops and I'm gonna get into you know, what happens in menopause, but basically, you run out of eggs in your ovaries. There's no more left. So the ovaries stop sending signals to the pituitary and you stop bleeding. So that's what happens in menopause. So how do we define menopause? The definition of menopause is basically the end of periods or the FMP is the final menstrual period. So once you have your last period, of course, you don't know it's your last until it's the, <laughs> until later on. But when it's been 12 months or a year without a period, you're officially menopausal 
and then you're going to be menopausal for the rest of your life. So menopause is marking that last period. And as I said, it's the end of the viable eggs in the ovaries. Um, and as I also just mentioned, that the production of estrogen and progesterone from the ovaries, for all intents and purposes, stops. There's still a little bit, but mostly it just stops. You can you can have menopause. Um, be, mostly people have menopause because you just naturally run out of eggs. So um, you know, when you're 50, the eggs in your ovaries are also 50, and they're mostly non-functional. But you can also go through menopause from surgical removal of the ovaries, like if you had an ovarian tumor. Um, and you had your ovaries removed, you would become menopausal at that point. Or you can have chemo chemotherapy or radiation that affects the ovaries and makes them non-functional for that reason. So what is, that's menopause. That's the, when the period stops and you're out of viable eggs. But what is perimenopause? People often ask me that. So perimenopause basically just means period of time leading up to menopause. Um, and that's the period of time when you start to have some hormonal changes um, in, in the um, ovaries, and it happens because the supply of viable eggs in the ovaries is dwindling, and that causes some changes um, in the ovaries, that, in, sorry, in the hormones that the ovaries are producing. Another word for perimenopause is the climacteric. That period of perimenopause, um, you know, when you start to have some hormonal changes, that can last many years. So typically what you see first when you are in early peri perimenopause, um, again, if you're not on a birth control pill or some other hormonal birth control, is you'll see some variability in the cycle. So instead of having um, a completely um, normal 28 or 35 day cycle like you have every month, periods will be a little bit early or perhaps a little bit late. And oftentimes in the beginning, they may be a little bit closer together, and then later on, they get start getting farther apart. So the, the perimenopause is the beginning of those changes. When does menopause happen? The average age for menopause is 51 and a half. Um, the usual range is between 40 and 58. Uh, but most people tend to cluster right around the early 50s mark um, or late 40s. Um, if you go through menopause prior to age 40, that would be considered premature menopause. It happens, but it, it's, it would be considered early. Anytime after age 40 is normal. And almost everybody is done by periods by around 58, 59. So um, I've, in, in what I've been talking about just, um, just now, I mentioned a couple of times, like if you're not on birth control. So a, a lot of questions that I get from people are, if I'm on a birth control pill or if I have a hormonal IUD, how do I know if I'm in menopause? And the short answer is you really don't. So if you're on a, a hormonal birth control, like say a birth control pill, you would just continue to have periods if you stayed on that. So what we usually do is when um, a patient gets to be around close to the, uh, the average age of menopause, which is around 51, 50 or so, um, you can go off that hormonal birth control and see where you are. So you, there are some lab tests you can do um, a few weeks after you stop the birth control to get a rough idea whether it seems like you have any viable left of, uh, eggs left in those ovaries, um, or you could just go off and see if you have any more periods or not. But um, basically, if you stay on that hormonal birth control, you, you wouldn't know if you had periods. I'm sorry, if, if you are menopausal. So that leads me to the next question that I often get, which is, do I need to get my hormones tested? So typically, you don't need to get your hormones tested as you're getting closer to menopause unless something seems wrong. So if you are, you know, age 48 and you're noticing that your periods are becoming less regular, that you're skipping periods, sometimes they might be, one, you know, every month, but then sometimes you might skip some. You're having some hot flashes. You're having some night sweats. That's just normal. So you don't really have to test your hormones to know that you're in perimenopause. You can just know that Yes, <laughs> you are in perimenopause, and that's that would be normal for you. Um, one scenario where you might want to get your hormones tested, or we would do that, is if you have those symptoms early. So say you're 35 and you're noticing that your periods are getting irregular and you're having hot flashes and night sweats. Well, since the average age of menopause is 51, that's pretty early. So at that point, we would test some hormones and see if anything's going on. 
Um, another scenario might be if you're just having some symptoms that don't seem typical of, you know, a kind of normal uh, perimenopause. So um, the hormonal changes of menopause, as I mentioned, um, the changes that happen are in estrogen and progesterone. And this is a complicated chart that talks about the normal menstrual cycle. And you don't need to pay too much attention to all of this. But the main thing that I wanted to point out is um, what happens in a normal menstrual cycle in terms of hormones. So we talked about estradiol and progesterone. And in this middle line thing where it says ovarian hormones, you can see an orange line, that's the estradiol. And then you can see a purple line and that's the progesterone. And you see how they go up and down in this kind of wave-like pattern. And this, if you looked at somebody's levels of hormone and you took their blood every day and then charted it like this, this is what you would normally see. So in a normal menstrual cycle in a month, you have this very regular up and down of estrogen and progesterone. But when you start getting closer to menopause, when you're in what we call perimenopause, that very regular wave-like pattern changes a lot. And again, it changes because the supply of viable eggs in the ovary is dwindling. So as you run out of eggs, the ovaries aren't really able to respond um, to that, to, I mean, to that, um, to those hormonal signals that they're receiving in a regular way. Some months they may um, be able to have a robust response and you'll actually have higher levels of estrogen, spikes of estrogen, and then you may have like deeper falls in estrogen and the same with progesterone. So instead of seeing this like wave up and down like this, you may see spike up, spike down. Some months you might have two spikes. So, um, and also that it leads to irregular bleeding as well. So these changes that happen in estrogen and progesterone um, can cause a lot of um, symptoms in your body because your body is used to this very, very regular wave um, of hormones. And now it's kind of chaotic and up and down and all over the place. Um, I just wanted to, before I go on to talk a little bit more about estrogen and progesterone, I just want to, I'm just checking this time talking too fast um, or slowly, but I think we're on track. So I just wanted to mention testosterone really quickly. Um, just to say that the ovaries also produce testosterone in women as well as men. Um, it's a lower level in women, but testosterone um, in menopause doesn't go way down the way they way that progesterone and estrogen does. Testosterone more, um, it starts to kind of slowly go down as you are in your reproductive years. And then it continues to kind of slowly go down after menopause and then kind of stays stable. So when we're talking about the changes of menopause, we're mostly really talking about progesterone and estrogen, not testosterone. And for that reason also, because testosterone doesn't take a huge drop after menopause, when we're talking about hormone therapy, we're typically not talking about the replacement of testosterone either. We're talking about estrogen and progesterone. That's all I want to say about that. So um, let's get back to estrogen and progesterone. Um, so actually of those two hormones, estrogen and progesterone, estrogen is really the one that makes the most difference in terms of symptoms. And that variability and then drop in estrogen after menopause um, is what really causes a lot of the symptoms that people experience in perimenopause and then in menopause after the periods end. So I think I already said this, but just to reiterate it, if I didn't. So I, we talked about in the perimenopause, you're having a kind of chaotic up and down of estrogen and progesterone. And then after menopause, when your period stops and you're completely out of eggs, the estrogen is low and stays low. There's a little variability for a number of years, about five years. But then after that, it's just going to be low and stay low. So there are estrogen receptors all over the body. So um, that's why that change in estrogen affects a lot of different body systems. Um, the brain has a lot of estrogen receptors and changes in estrogen can affect many things like your mood. Um, so some of the symptoms of menopause that are common, hot flashes and night sweats is probably the most common symptom. Also irritability, mood changes, sleep disturbance. Um, by sleep disturbance, usually what I'm talking about is frequent nighttime awakening. If you've ever had that, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Also, skin changes. Um, mostly that means um, dry skin. 
vaginal dryness and a loss of elasticity of the vagina and the vulva is a really common thing. Sometimes some hair thinning on the head or some increased hair growth of the face, not heavy hair growth, but just a little bit. Sometimes like those little single hairs you can get. Changes in libido. Some people experience an increase in libido in perimenopause, but very, very many people experience a drop in libido. That's really common. Also some weight gain around, especially around the belly, around the middle is really common. Some people have some joint pain and a little muscle, a little more muscle pain. And we're not talking about like severe joint pain or swelling, but just a little more achy feeling. Um, a lot of people talk about memory impairment. And again, we're not talking about serious uh, memory problems, but what some people call mem menopause brain. Um, and it just means that you're feeling a little bit less sharp, a little more foggy, like words might not come to you as, more, as quite as quickly, or you walk into a room and forget why you, why you came there, that, that kind of thing. And then loss of bone density. Although loss of bone density, that's bones do thin as you go into menopause, but that actually isn't anything that you're going to feel. That's just something that's happening. And I'm not going to get into too much about um, the physiology or the reasons that all of these changes happen, although I'm happy to do that in the question and answer period if, if people have questions about that. But I will just mention um, hot flashes and night sweats and irritability for a second, because those are I think really the hallmarks of um, kind of the problematic symptoms that people can have. So for hot flashes and night sweats, we're not 100% sure actually in research as to why that happens, but it appears to be that the reason is that the area of your brain that controls your body temperature has estrogen receptors right next to it. So when you have fluctuation in estrogen, those estrogen receptors in your brain right next to your body temperature gauge, the body temperature gauge gets kind of out of whack. So you end up overheating and what you, you can feel that really intense heat in your core. And then you start sweating to cool yourself down and then you start shivering. So this can, the hot flat, that can be a hot flash. And some people experience hot flashes as, or mostly as hot, people experience hot flashes lasting a few minutes. So you will feel all of a sudden this kind of flush of heat usually in your chest or neck, and then you can get all red in the face and the, the neck and start sweating and cool down. But some people just feel kind of hotter all the time. They're, they're not necessarily having like that heat, intense heat feeling, but you can just feel a bit warmer, especially at night, kicking off the covers and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so night sweats are just basically a hot flash that happens at night. Although for a lot of people, they seem to be more intense at night. Um, and that is partly why people have the sleep disturbances because of the changes in body temperature. And then the irritability and mood changes, I just wanted to mention briefly too. So that that is like I mentioned earlier, because the changes in estrogen affects your brain chemistry and that there are estrogen receptors in your brain. Um, and that the changes in estrogen can also affect your serotonin levels and other um, brain chemicals that can then cause um, irritability. A lot of patients talk about feeling more um, kind of angry or <laughs> quick to um, react, like not as patient as they used to be. And again, when I'm talking about these symptoms, I, I don't want to make it seem like, oh, everybody's going to experience all of these symptoms or, or even most people. But um, there's a real big range of symptoms in terms, you know, some people might have go through perimenopause and menopause, have a few hot flashes, a few night sweats, maybe feel a crabby here and there, whatever, but it's really not a big deal and their periods end and it's done. And that's, that's great. But then there are people who have really intense symptoms. I mean, I have certainly patients and maybe some people who are listening are those kind of people who have hot flashes, you know, 30 times a day waking up six times a night in a full sweat, getting your pajamas all soaking and feeling, you know, really crabby and exhausted and um, waking up all the time. So it can be this perimenopause and, and menopause can be very intense for some people. And it doesn't mean that if you're one of those people, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or that your, your hormones are out of whack or there's a, you know, something medically wrong. It just means that you probably are one of those people that are very sensitive to hormonal changes and that for whatever reason, the changes in estrogen is affecting you um, severely. So that's the kind of pe person who might want to consider taking some kind of medication or doing, you know, some kind of modality to help with the symptoms of menopause. 
Oh, I just want to mention this really quickly, and I'm going to go move on from this. I don't want to waste too much time on it. But um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, we talked about all the symptoms of menopause, but that how you think of menopause will affect kind of how you approach it. Um, menopause can be seen as a natural transition like puberty. Um, and, you know, there's a, as I list here, there are a lot of symptoms that can happen with puberty, but we kind of take that in stride because it's seen as part natural part of life. Um, but some people also approach menopause as a deficiency state. An example of that would be hypothyroidism. So the thyroid gland in your neck controls a lot of your body symptoms. If your thyroid is not producing enough hormone, you have a lot of symptoms like dry skin, weight gain, and mood changes. And if your thyroid isn't producing enough thyroid hormone, you take a thyroid hormone. Naturally, that you know that's kind of how you approach it. You take a medication to fix that. So I tend, tend to go with a natural transition kind of approach to menopause. That doesn't mean that I don't think you should use some you know medication if you need it, but I tend to see it more as um, a natural transition rather than a deficiency state. Also, I, <laughs> in this too, since I'm talking a lot about the problems that can occur in menopause, I just wanted to also mention that there are some positive things that can happen in, in menopause too. Um, so it's not all bad. Um, one thing is maturity. Um, we, I think our culture doesn't tend to value aging, particularly in women, very much. But um, reaching the mature maturity and reaching menopause, I think, is definitely an accomplishment. Some people say that they feel more self-confident after menopause and feel more assertive um, and powerful. I put decreased libido on here. Decreased libido for most people is a complaint and they feel, you know, that they're missing something if their interest in sex goes down. But there are other people who feel like, you know, it's kind of nice to not have to think about sex all the time and worry about if you're feeling attractive or whatever. So it could be a positive for some people. And again, I don't want to say that that's going to happen to everybody. Some people who do have decreased libido and it is a common complaint, but it certainly is um, true for everybody. Another positive is no premenstrual symptoms. That's excellent. Um, stabilization of hormone levels can cause stabilization in mood. Having no periods is great. You don't have to worry about tampons and pads. And for a lot of people, not worrying about becoming pregnant is freeing and feels like a relief and not having to worry about birth control. So um, let's talk a little bit about what you can do. If you are one of those people who have severe symptoms of menopause, bad hot flashes, night sweat, irritability, sleep problems, you may want to consider doing something about it. I think these are all the list of things you could do. Expectant management basically means just dealing with it until it's over. Um, and in terms of how long this is going to last, um, the, like I said, the symptoms of menopause can start years before your period ends, and they can last for several years afterwards. Average um, of this kind of symptomatic time is about seven years, actually, and can last up to 10. Um, lifestyle changes has to do with just kind of optimizing your health in terms of exercise and healthy eating and that type of thing. Um, and then complementary therapies, that's things like acupuncture and Chinese medicine, herbal medications I'm going to get into a little bit. Um, SSRIs and SNRIs are antidepressants. Um, they're also used for menopausal symptoms at times. A medication called gabapentin, oxybutynin, and finally hormone therapy. So uh, I'm going to start by focusing on hormone therapy. So when we talk about hormone therapy, as I said before, um, not so much testosterone, we're talking about estrogen and progestin or estrogen alone. So why would you use one or the other? So if you have a uterus, you do need to take estrogen with progestin. So that's most women. Uh, if you've had a hysterectomy, you don't need to use the progestin, you can just use estrogen alone. Hysterectomy meaning the removal of the uterus. Um, so let me explain that, why that is briefly. Um, if you have a uterus and you just took estrogen by itself, uh, you would that estrogen would thicken the uterine lining. If you think back to when we talked about the menstrual cycle, the, the estrogen thickens the uterine lining, and then you would start having bleeding. So it, it basically, you'd be menopausal, but the estrogen would cause you to have bleeding. And also that thickening or growth of that tissue of the lining of the uterus, if it's just stimulated by estrogen without balancing with progestin, could put you at risk for uterine cancer. So you do have to take estrogen with progestin. If you take them both together, you should not have vaginal bleeding. That should stay stable. Um, and you should not put yourself at risk for uterine cancer. 
So those two go together. Um, estrogen alone, if you don't have the uterus, you don't have to worry about uterine cancer or irregular bleeding. So you can just take the estrogen by itself and that will help with the symptoms. This is a long slide. Again, I'm not gonna go over this in detail, but I just wanted to mention that a, a vast majority of the information that we have about the effects of uh, hormone therapy in menopausal women came from this study called the Women's Health Initiative, which was completed in 2002. It was a huge study. They had over 160,000 women, postmenopausal women, ages 50 to 79, and that it was a 15 year study. Um, and they looked at it was it was a placebo controlled randomized study, meaning they had some women who took fake medication. <laughs> they were on a placebo and some women who took hormone therapy. And then they you saw what happened to all those women. The study was stopped early because they did see an increased risk for breast cancer. So um, it, it was um, stopped after five point two years. So let's get on to go, talk about some of the, oh, let me, let me back up and say, so that's one, of, that's one of the huge areas that we've seen, gotten our information about the risks and benefits of hormone therapy, but there have been further studies after that, and there certainly were studies before that. And that study, the data from that study, which was voluminous, has been re-looked re at many times. So when we talk about risks and benefits of hormone therapy, if we look at the, at the estrogen alone without the progestin, the risks include blood clot and stroke, and the benefits, well, the main benefit is that it decreases hot flashes, night sweats, irritability, and improves sleep, um, but also it decreases risk for osteoporosis. That's a side benefit. And the risks and benefits of hormone therapy, the estrogen plus progesterone, the risks include blood clot, um, that's uh, deep vein fun thrombosis um, and um, emb pulmonary embolism, stroke, coronary heart disease, and breast cancer. The benefits, in addition to symptom control, are decreased risk for osteoporosis and decreased risk for colon cancer. So, you know, those that, that sounds pretty scary if you look at it. Those are some very serious risks, but um, the amount of risk is actually not huge, depending on the person and their prior health. So when you look, this is kind of a, an estimate, but when you look at combined um, hormone therapy, the estrogen plus progestin per a thousand women uh, using the hormone therapy for five years, these are women from ages 50 to 59, which would be the typical people who would be using hormone therapy. The risk for heart attack, you'd find 2.5 more women per thousand if they were using hormone therapy. For breast cancer, three more per 100,000 for five years using hormone therapy. Stroke, 2.5. Pulmonary embolism, three more. Colon cancer, less, half a woman less. Hip fracture, one and a half women less per 1,000. And interestingly, in the research on from that Women's Health Initiative, for all-cause mortality, meaning um, looking at women who died in the study for all reasons, they actually saw five fewer women dying who took the hormone therapy versus not, even though there were all these increased risks that I talked about. So I know that it's really hard to think about risk and assess, like, what does it mean, you know, per 1,000 women per five years? It's, it's hard to conceptualize that. But what I would say about it is that, yes, the risks are serious, but the numbers are small. So, you know, uh, 2.5 and 1,000 is a bit, it sounds like a big number perhaps, but it's small. Anyway, <laughs> I won't belabor that too much, but um, we can talk a little bit more about that risk if people have questions about that. And whoop, why is this not working? Hold on one sec. Huh, I'm having trouble getting to my next slide. There we go. Okay, so um, the estimating risks for the estrogen ther alone therapy. So again, per thousand women, using the hormone therapy, the estrogen for five years, you would have 5.5 less women have heart disease, um, 2.5 less have breast cancer in this part using the estrogen alone, um, a little bit less women having a stroke, less than one, um, pulmonary embolism, that's the blood clot, you'd have uh, 1.5 more women 
somewhat less, a tiny bit less colon cancer and all, all cause mortality, meaning all, all cause of death, you'd have five point few, fewer women. So basically it, in the studies that were done on the estrogen alone, it looks like that ha, has less risk than the combination of estrogen and progesterone, but you do have to use the estrogen with the progesterone if you have the uterus. Okay, so factors that affect the risk of hormone therapy. So it, the risk that we're talking about, it depends on a few things. One of them is how old you are when you start the hormone therapy. So if it appears that in the research, if you start the hormone therapy closer to the time of menopause, meaning within about five years of ending your periods, the risk is lower than if you waited, like say 10 years and then started it. Um, and that probably is because there are changes that happen in the body when your estrogen is low. Um, and then if you go in 10 years later and you add estrogen back in again, things are disrupted, like in your cardiovascular system. So it is safer to use closer to the time of menopause. The root of the administration of the hormone therapy seems to make a difference. So hormone therapy can be taken as a pill. It can be taken as transdermal. That's a patch. Um, it could also, there's a vaginal ring. Um, and there's creams that you can use. It appears that in the research, um, this is, bleh, <laughs> lost that. It appears in the research that the root of administration makes a difference. So that, um, especially for blood clots, that if you take the uh, hormone therapy orally, it's more risky and there's more chance of having a blood clot than if you take it as transdermally through your skin like a patch. The reason for that is because when you take a pill, an oral pill, it goes through your digestive system and through your liver. So when you take oral estrogen, it goes through the liver and the liver producing clot produces clotting factors and that in, what's increases your risk for blood clot. Whereas if it goes through your skin, it misses that what we call the first pass effect through your liver. So it doesn't increase your risk for blood clots, at least it appears that it's significantly less. So it is safer to take it as a patch. And then we don't know if 100% about this, but there are different types of estrogen and progestins, um, and it looks like it's possible that the type of estrogen and progestin that you use may be safer or more risky, but we don't, don't have head-to-head -head studies on these, so it's hard to stay 100%. I think the next slide, I'm going to go on to talk about that a little more. Um, let me see. Hold on. Yeah, actually, that's in a slide coming up. But so I'll move to this next and then we'll get to that, the types of estrogen and progestin. So there are some people who would not be good candidates to use hormone therapy. And that is basically if you have a history of breast cancer, if you have a history of heart disease, like a heart attack or stroke, um, and if you have active liver disease um, or if you have um, uterine cancer. So those are those are reasons why you may not be able to use uh, hormone therapy. So now I'm getting back, circling back to what I was talking about before when I talked about the types of estrogen. So in that big study that I mentioned to you um, in, the, in my slides before, it was just called the Women's Health Initiative. They used a kind of estrogen that's called Premarin um, and that's produced, um, it's actually manufactured initially based on a pregnant mare's urine. So it, it's a type of a horse, horse uh, estrogen, or it's, <laughs> I hate to say it, and it sounds bad, but basically it is um, that uh, estrogens that are produced um, in equine or horses, by horses. Um, and it is effective in women for, uh, in human women for the symptoms of menopause, but it isn't chemically the same as um, your a female human body would produce. So we know the risks and benefits of Premarin. It isn't 100% clear if there are more risks or less risks, if we use what we call bioidentical hormones, and bioidentical hormones means hormones that are chemically identical to the hormones that your body is producing, that's estrogen and progesterone. And those, those hormones, estrogen and progesterone, which are bioidentical, are commercially available, meaning you don't have to use necessarily that Premarin um, uh, type of estrogen. You can use um, bioidentical estrogen, and those are manufactured now um, in patch or pill form. Um, but, you know, it sounds like it probably would be a better idea to use those bioidentical hormones, but the 
the research is not there yet to say whether that is safer or not. We, we are, hopefully we'll learn that as we go along. Um, I wanted to make a brief mention of compounded hormones. So just because compounded hormones are very popular right now, what compounded hormones are, are those are um, hormone therapy, either pills or often creams or patches, but mostly they're creams actually, that are made in a pharmacy. So they're not manufactured in a, in a medic, medica, medication uh, manufacturing facility. They're actually made in the pharmacy by basically by hand in small batches. So it, that sounds good. You know, it sounds nice to make something in a small batch. And that sounds like maybe they're making it, you know, specifically for you in the small batch. But there are some big downsides to that. Um, and chiefly that, that medications, hormone therapy and other medications that are compounded or produced or made in the pharmacy itself um, are not regulated by the FDA. And so there is not FDA oversight of those batches of hormones that they're preparing. So if they're mixing up, you know, the pharmacist is mixing up some hormone therapy, they don't have to go through the same um, FDA uh, oversight that they would if it's being man manufactured in a, in a facility. So there is safety concerns about compounded hormones. And generally, it's considered safer to use um, FDA approved, commercially available and prescribed medications. Compounded hormones are also not covered by insurance because they're not FDA approved. So it's not that it's impossible, you know, it's horrible to use these, but, uh, you know, there are big safety concerns about it. So take home notes for hormone therapy. Um, you know, I just wanted to summarize kind of what I was saying, and that is who should use hormone therapy? Use it if you need it, but don't if you don't. So if you're going through menopause and you're doing fine, and you have just some small complaints, but you're feeling like, you know, I can manage this, I'm, I'm handling it, then you don't need to use hormone therapy. Um, but if you're really suffering and things are not going well, you certainly should consider it. Um, you, Generally speaking, it's best to use the lowest dose to control the symptoms and to start that using hormone therapy, if you can, closer to the onset of menopause. So, you know, if you're having a really struggling, um, you could go ahead and bring that up with your nurse practitioner or doctor and think about starting hormone therapy rather than waiting 10 years and then doing it. And also use it for as long as you need it, but not longer. So in terms of how long people use hormone therapy, it's it's based on the individual, but um, at, the risk goes up the longer you use it. And when I'm talking about the longer, you know, we try to keep the use of hormone therapy to within about five, use for about five years if possible. That risk of breast cancer that I mentioned in the studies of hormone therapy, that went up after five years of use. So to avoid increasing the risk of breast cancer, if possible, we try to keep it less than that. Some people may need it longer, but um, typically somebody might not use hormone therapies for a few years um, and then try to go off and see if you're okay. For most people, eventually you're going to be okay without hormone therapy. So you may be having struggling and have a really hard time right around menopause, like in the few years before your period stops and then a few years after. But slowly with time, your body's kind of settle in. And for most people, you know, you kind of wean down on the hormone therapy and then you'll be able to get off of it. Um, so I'm going to say just a, just a minute about um, some other options besides hormone therapy that are effective for the symptoms of menopause. One of them are antidepressants. And I guess, I, you know, really, I shouldn't call them antidepressants because they're used for a lot of other things. They're used for anxiety. Um, they're used for other mental health issues. But they can also be used for hot flashes and night sweats and irritability and sleep problems that happen with menopause. Not all of this class of medication is effective, but some of them are. Um, there is a FDA approved um, medication in this class called Brisdel. That's the brand name. Uh, the generic name is paroxetine mesylate, and um, it is found to be effective for hot flashes. Um, but you can also find similar results in studies with venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine, paroxetine, uh, citalopram, and escitalopram. So any of these medications could be used for um, the symptoms of menopause. In terms of like, why would you use this instead of hormone therapy? Well, we talked about that there are some people who can't take hormone therapy if they had breast cancer or 
um, if you have heart disease. So this could be another good option if you can't use hormone therapy. Um, also, um, if you're having a lot of mood problems, if um, the main issue that you're having is anxiety or irritability, depression, then, you know, these would be great to use because it could also, it could hit both of those things. It can help with the mood problems and it also help with the hot flashes. In terms of effectiveness, uh, it does seem to be slightly less effective for most people than hormone therapy, which works amazing, but um, it can also be quite effective and for some people possibly equally effective. So that's the SSRIs. Other medications that you can use, um, there is gabapentin. Gabapentin is um, a medication that's used for a bunch of things. Um, in high doses, it can be used for seizure disorders. Um, it can also be used for nerve pain. <laughs> if anybody's ever had shingles, sometimes it's used for things like that. Um, it's not a narcotic, though, um, or an op opioid. Um, and at lower doses, it can be used for hot flashes and night sweats, and it can be quite effective for that. Gabapentin tends to make people a little sleepy, so um, I tend to prescribe it for hot, or, I'm sorry, for night sweats mostly. Um, some people do great with it. Other people um, find that it has some side effects. Uh, it can make you feel a bit groggy in the morning. Um, some people also just fe feel like not quite right um, mentally, make like they feel like a little foggy, that kind of thing. Um, so you have to kind of try that and see it, you know, if, it, if you like it or you don't like it. But um, that is a, a medication that can be effective for hot flashes. And then oxybutynin. Oxybutynin has been around for a long time. It is used chiefly for overactive bladder, which is like when you're, you know, you know, that that ad that's like, gotta go, gotta go. <laughs> Got to go right now. So, yeah. So if you have overactive bladder, if you feel like you have to urinate all the time, you can take oxybutynin. But surprisingly, they found that women were, that were taking oxybutynin and were perimenopausal were having less hot flashes. So therefore, it started being used for hot flashes and night sweats. The main downside of oxybutynin is that it can cause dry mouth, uh, dry eyes kind of thing, which is why people for overactive bladder often don't like to take it for that reason. But if you're somebody who can't take hormone therapy or have you just happen to have a overactive bladder, oxybutynin might be a, a good thing to use when you're in perimenopause to help with the overactive bladder, plus with the hot flashes and night sweats. And then finally, there's um, basodioxaphene, conjugated estrogen. This is just a random kind of extra thing that you, you know, medication that has the estrogen, but instead of a progestin, it has this other thing that basodioxaphene. This one is good um, because it, 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 it's possible that this one may decrease risk for breast cancer and help with uh, bone density as well. So there are a few people, you know, that this might be targeted to, but it wouldn't be generally the go-to, but it could, could work for cer certain situations. Other options for the symptoms of menopause, there's herbals. I'm not an herbalist, so I can't speak with a lot of uh, authority on this, but um, and actually, if, if somebody is really interested in herbal therapies for the symptoms of menopause, I always encourage people to see a naturopath if possible, because they're the people who generally have more information about this. But there's a few um, that I feel comfortable kind of prescribing and talking about. One of them is Siberian rhubarb. There is a small study that was quite rigorous, although it had small number of people that showed that it was effective for hot flashes and night sweats. And in the study, which was only for a small length of time, but within the study, there were no serious health events with that. And then black cohosh. There's been a few small studies on black cohosh. It is commonly available. Both of these are over the counter and you can get them at wherever the pharmacy or the co-op. Um, black cohosh. Um, some of the studies show that it's helpful. Other studies show it's not. Um, it, there doesn't seem to be any huge health risks with it, but there's just really not a lot of research on herbs. So in terms of safety and efficacy, it's really hard to know for sure. Um, but those are once some herbs that are available. Um, hypnotherapy is something else that you can try. Hypnotherapy is basically hypnosis. Um, but there have been some studies on hypnotherapy that show that it can be effective for um, decreasing hot flashes and night sweats. Also mindfulness meditation, which probably just helps you stay calm and um, can decrease the um, the stress that, that comes with hot flashes and night sweats, acupuncture and Chinese medicine. 
is another option. There's not a ton of studies on that. There's some small ones that, and some that have shown benefit and some haven't, but some definitely, you know, probably acupuncture can be helpful and um, couldn't hurt. And then cognitive behavioral therapy, which is just talk therapy, but there's been some studies that show that can be helpful as well. So lots of different things that you could try. So that's my, that's the basics that I, I want to talk about the management of menopause, but I just wanted to talk specifically about one symptom of menopause because it is so ubiquitous, which means it's so common. And that is what we call genitourinary syndrome of menopause, otherwise known as vaginal dryness. And I'm sure everybody's seen those ads for vaginal dryness, like a rose that's, that's kind of dying or something. But um, many, many people experience vaginal dryness after menopause. That's after, after your period stops, usually not before. Um, and I would say most people have some of these symptoms that, that the vagina is a little bit drier. But it's not just actually drier. That, that low estrogen really affects the tissue of the vagina so that it, it, it does get drier. But it, you also lose kind of the stretch and elasticity there. So if you are sexually active, it can be quite uncomfortable. Um, and lubricants don't necessarily fix it because it's not just dry. Like I said, it's also less stretchy. So um, some of the symptoms of this can be dryness, irritation, burning pain with urination. Some people can get recurrent urinary tract infections or pain with intercourse. Luckily, this symptom is very fixable um, and with low risk. The main thing that you can do is use topical estrogens. And these are little low doses of estrogen that are used directly inside the vagina. There's very little systemic absorption, meaning absorption of the medication of the estrogen into the body. So it does not carry the risk of taking estrogen, like if you're trying to treat hot flashes and night sweats. This is really just for the skin. So it does not carry any of those risks that we just talked about if it's used at the recommended doses. And these are pictures of some of the types of estrogen that you can use. There's this one here on the top is called Vagifem. It's little tablets, like little pills, and you insert them into the vagina with these little inserters. And most of these you do twice a week. So you do that twice a week. Or there's a ring that I show here that you put in the vagina, that one you wear for three months at a time, and then you just switch it out. So you always wear it. There's these little capsules that are gel caps that melt, or there's cream that you insert with an inserter. Um, so if you use these on a regular basis, what you'll find is that it gives back the stretchiness and pinkness to the tissue and, and the lubrication. So you don't have the pain with intercourse and you just decrease your risk of recurrent urinary tract infection if that's something that happens. So not everybody has to use those. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, everybody usually just experiences some degree of vaginal dryness, but for some people, just using a lubricant is adequate. And if it's not, then, you know, you can use the estrogen. There's also some non-estrogens. Some people can't use estrogen at all. Like if you have a history of stroke or blood clots, not, not necessarily a good idea. Or if you have a history of estrogen dependent breast cancer. So you can try lubricants and I've listed some over the counters that are good. You can also use a vaginal moisturizer like Replens, which is just like a moisturizer like you would use for your hands, but it's for the vagina. And there's another non-estrogen called um, hyaluronic acid that's an over-the-counter. That's a really good one. It um, Hyaluronic acid is an acid that your body produces in wound healing. Um, and it is in some cosmetic products that you might see like for your skin of your face for wrinkles and stuff but it also is available in a capsule like a gel cap kind of thing uh, for the vagina it's reverie is one brand name um, and that you put in the vagina also a few times a week and it helps with the um, all the symptoms of um, the genital urinary syndrome of menopause um, it is fairly expensive so it's not it's not the greatest for that reason but um, it is effective if you can't use estrogen. And I believe that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to answer some questions if anybody has questions. Sue, are you thank there? You. Yes, thank you, Rebecca. That was Hi. awesome. Well Great. done. That was some really fantastic information. And um, there, is some, there is some questions too. Um, but okay. I do um, invite the audience to type in their questions in the Q&A for Rebecca. Um, oh, oh, somebody's already said, Rebecca, that was so awesome. Great. And thank oh, you. Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad you got something out of it. Right. 
Um, okay, first question. Where are estrogen and progesterone produced in the body? Oh, good question. So um, estrogen and progesterone are produced in the ovaries. I don't know if you saw that slide in the very beginning of my presentation, but the ovaries um, contain the eggs um, and their purpose is to release eggs for fertilization and become pregnant. And as also as part of that, they also produce estrogen and progesterone. And the estrogen and progesterone also affect the lining of the uterus, and that's what causes periods to happen as well. Excellent. Uh, next question. Is the lab test for determining if you're in menopause while on birth control a blood test or something else? Right. So actually, you it, you can't take it. It is a blood test, and you can't take it while you're on uh, birth control because you're taking estrogen and progesterone if you're on a birth control. That's what a birth control pill is. So if you tested your blood while you're on a birth control pill, you're just going to have a, you know, test result that says you're on birth control. <laughs> um, so you have to go off the birth control pill or whatever you're on and wait a few weeks for it to clear from your system and then you can take it. But that test actually is called an FSH. It's a follicle stimulating hormone. It's not 100% um, predictive of whether you're in menopause. That FSH level will rise in menopause, but it can go kind of up and down. So just one test result won't say 100%. Yes, you're 100, you know you're done with periods. It'll just get us uh, a good idea whether you're not or whether you are. But it wouldn't be like one test wouldn't say like definitely you're done. It would just say probably you are or probably you're not. Very good. Thank you. Uh, next question, is hormone therapy different from hormone replacement therapy? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, no, it's the same thing. And it, uh, initially, like years ago more, we used to call it hormone replacement therapy. And now more people are calling it hormone therapy because the, the reason, it's just a language thing. But when you say hormone replacement therapy, you're implying that you really need to replace those hormones because they're lost. Like, and, and like I was saying, you know, when you look at menopause as a natural life transition, you don't necessarily have to replace those hormones. People do fine and live the rest of their life without hormone therapy. So you're not really replacing them. You're just taking hormones. So that's why they kind of changed it, the language from hormone replacement therapy to hormone therapy. But it's the same thing. Huh. Interesting. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Kimberly also wanted to let you know, thank you for this very informative presentation. So oh, you're welcome. Very, uh, happy attendee. Uh, next question. If you're doing uh, hormone therapy, how do you know when to stop? Yeah, that's a, that's a really common question. So, um, usually I, if you, if you're having, in, you know, bad enough symptoms that you want to use hormone therapy. I would usually encourage people to use it for at least six months to a year, because if you take it and go off, you know, less than that, you're probably going to be back where you started from. But if you give it at least a year, things may have kind of settled down um, in your physiology and, if, and you might be able to get off at that point. So usually with my patients, I recommend, um, you know, maybe once a year or so trying if trying to either go down on your dosage or if you're already on a really low dosage going off and seeing where you're at, you do want to kind of taper it down. So if you're starting at kind of a moderate dose, you can step, there's, there's like six or six, six levels of uh, strengths of hormone therapy. So you kind of, kind of step down a little bit every year or so until you're off. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I would say. Usually about once a year, you give it a try see and see how you do. Great. Thank you. Good feedback. Uh, next question. Are new onset headaches a part of the perimenopausal symptoms to be expected? Um, so interesting question. Um, definitely people who are prone to headaches can have more headaches around perimenopause, particularly people who have migraines, because a lot of people who have migraines uh, are triggered by the migraines are triggered by changes in estrogen, particularly drop in estrogen, and that's why you see a lot of women getting um, migraines prior to um, periods because there's a drop in estrogen right before your period, and that can trigger a migraine. So if you're if you have migraines and you're sensitive to estrogen, you're probably going to get worse headaches in perimenopause. In terms of new onset of headaches. I mean, you can have some more headaches in perimenopause, but if you have onset of like a different type of headache that you've never had before and they're, and they're bad, 
that needs to be looked into because it's not typical to have like an, you know, a new different type of headache. You can have more tension type headaches. And if you have migraines, you can have more migraines, but that's, that's really the extent of it. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so next question. So the ovaries don't produce eggs. They just store them. Yeah, that's right. So um, the ovaries, you're, when you're born, those eggs are all stuffed in there. <laughs> There's all those, <laughs> those eggs already there. And then they just hold them and then they release them. So they don't just store them because they also, when you, so I'm doing the two ovaries here, when you um, have a monthly cycle, one of the ovaries get stimulated by the hormones from the brain and they will produce a follicle with an egg in it. And then that egg gets released. So your the ovary kind of gets those eggs ready and then it releases one every month, sometimes more than one. Wow, fascinating. Yeah. Uh, uh, next question, uh, how long can you stay on birth control? It depends on what you, the, your health condition. If you don't have any contraindications, any meaning any reasons why you can't be on the birth control pill, you can stay on until around the average age of menopause. Reasons why you would have to go off of birth control pill would be things like high blood pressure, heart disease, um, maybe, um, well, that's really it. Those are the main ones. History of blood clot or stroke, liver disease. So if you, diabetes. So if you start developing those things, it, it is riskier to use um, hormonal birth control that has estrogen in it uh, be, because it does have risk for blood clot and stroke. Um, but if you don't have those things, um, you can stay on right through um, around age 51 or so. And then that's when we usually try to see if you can go off. And Excellent. some people can transition directly on to hormone therapy if they need to. Hmm. Wow. Um, it looks like that is the last question. Um, oh, wait a minute. I, sorry, hold on. There is another one. Uh, okay. Thank you for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, what are your thoughts about the use of the different hormonal IUDs as the source of progestin, uh, progestin in combined menopausal hormone therapy? Yeah, I think that's a, um, though that's a really uh, something that I, I like and I use. Um, typically, I have used the um, progestin IUD, which is the Mirena or the Laletta, that dosage. Um, so, you know, just for people who aren't familiar with what we're talking about, we talked about that you needed estrogen plus progestin. Um, you can, instead of taking a pill for progesterone, progestin, or using a patch, um, you can use an IUD, which has progestin in it. Um, and that also helps protect you against pregnancy. So you can use it in perimenopause and then just continue to use it um, to protect your uterus if you want to go on estrogen after menopause. It is an off-label use, meaning that there it's not FDA approved for that use, but there is research that um, shows that it is safe and efficacious and that it does protect the uterus against uterine cancer and, cancer and irregular bleeding. So I do think that's a, certainly a nice option for, for a lot of people, especially in that transition where you're not sure if you're menopausal, you are still worried about pregnancy, but you're having hot flashes and night sweats. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there a court? Next question, uh, is there a correlation between the age when the period begins and ends? Um, no. So um, a bunch of people have asked me that question in the past. I actually have never looked it up, but I have never heard that. I don't think it is. There it is. Um, I don't think it's like a thing like if you start early, you end early or something like that. I don't I don't think there's necessarily a correlation. Excellent. Um, we are at time and I don't see any new questions popping up. Um, but I want to say that this has been really fantastic, Rebecca, and I appreciate your expertise in this topic. And, oh, you're uh, quite welcome. It was super fun. I enjoyed it. Yep. Oh, and another thank you from an attendee. Yeah, it was really terrific, welcome. Rebecca. And thank you for your time. And well, thank you um, all for attending. Yeah. Appreciate Wonderful. it. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.